Welcome back. I'm Chris Moore with HVAC Pro Blog, and this week I'm excited to present a recorded webinar from one year ago for my Patreon members on the power requirements for heat pumps. We're going to talk about tolerances, breakers, surge protectors, buck boosters, high and low voltage from street power, generators, and PV with storage. Without further ado, here's the training. So the first thing I'm going to talk about and just get off the table is breakers. How breakers are sized and really what they protect. If you didn't know, a breaker is really there for when there's a large amperage draw and this usually happens with a voltage drop, right? So during a brownout, you would expect a breaker to actually trip. Or if there's such a high amperage draw because a motor is locked, let's say a condenser fan motor or a compressor, or there's a short to ground, that would cause a really high amperage draw and the breaker to trip. Now, there is a rule of thumb out there to size a breaker that does not apply to today's variable speed heat pumps. On the older single stage and multi-stage equipment, you used to be able to take the capacity of the system, the rated capacity, divided by the EER, and that would give you the max alternating current wattage. This rule of thumb actually worked fairly well for my grandfather's heat pumps, let's say, but not today's heat pumps. For today's heat pumps, you're gonna to need to first find out the watts that the system is operating at in order to size your breaker. Now, there's a lot of information out there. If you have, let's say, a Mitsubishi heat pump or some other brand, they publish what the max fuse size is and the maximum circuit ampacity. But if you're gonna do this longhand, it's actually very simple. It's volts times amps, right? Now, a lot of times you're given watts and you know the volts, and you need to find amps in order to figure out how big the breaker needs to be. You just have to move this equation around. Everybody knows that watts is volts times amps. When you move the equation around, what you find is amps equals watts divided by volts. But there's a rule in the National Electrical Code, it's called the 80% rule. So just when you get that amps, that's not it. You actually have to figure the breaker size by multiplying those amps times 1.25 that will give you the nearest breaker size. And of course, you're probably gonna round up. Remember, if the math works out, let's say 120 volt system and it's really small, and the math works out to let's say 12 or 13, you're not gonna be putting in a 10 amp breaker, right? You're gonna be upping that to a 15 amp and you're gonna size the wire accordingly. Most breakers come in 15, 20, 25, 30, or 35 amps. And when you're wiring some of these larger four or five ton let's say mini split condensers, they could be as high as 50 amps. It's very important to get this amperage draw and breaker size correct during installation. You need to protect the system. If the breaker size is too large, you could end up costing a lot more in failed equipment or even burning wires and a possibly a burnt home, right? All right, so we addressed breakers and brownouts, but what if the voltage goes the other way? Let's say we have a, a surge or a spike, right, in the power voltage. That is actually protected with something different called a surge protector. A lot of houses now, it's actually an electrical code that you install surge protection for whole home panels, right? If you don't have that in your panel, I highly recommend you protect anything with a circuit board. And I always tell guys, I would never go out and buy, let's say, a brand new 60 inch TV and just plug it directly into the wall, right? No, I use a surge protector in order to protect that new investment. Is all that circuitry in there. You can't avoid this when it comes to variable speed heat pumps. I mean, or even any other high efficient heating or cooling system these days. Even the wall mount boilers need a surge protector. Now, when you size the surge protector, you're gonna look for the UC value. And that UC value is basically what the system can run at continuously for voltage without needing to protect it. Also remember, it's gonna do nothing if it's at that voltage or less. So if you oversize a surge protector, it's not gonna protect the system. As an example, you might have a surge protector on a compressor or condenser in a residential home, 240, right? It's not gonna do anything when the voltage is below that, but when it spikes above that, 
that's when it's gonna send the extra excess volts to ground. It's actually gonna interrupt the circuit typically. Keep in mind, it's not when it's one volt above either. There's some distance there. It's gonna take a little while for it to actually trip and send those volts to ground. Also, really important, make sure your surge protectors have a really good ground signal. There should be no resistance to ground. All right, now I'm gonna couple them both together. There are some devices out there that will protect you against surges and voltage drops. Typically, I actually liked the Compressor Defender. It's made by Intermatic or their AG3000. The reason I like that one is that there was a green indicator to know if the surge protector is still good. If it took a hit, it would either go out or turn red. Not only will these devices protect you against power surges and brownouts, but also short cycling. If the power goes out, comes back on, and this can happen when you use, uh, let's say, backup generators, switches back and forth a couple times. There are situations where that, you know, especially if it's dirty power, could cause compressor or control board failures. Now, if you live in an area that has constant power struggles, meaning the voltage is always low in the summer because there's such a high load, and this can happen, you know, if you're too far away from the local transformer in really remote rural areas. Typically in the city where it's really uh, dense and a lot of homes and a lot of services, the voltage is actually pretty high because you're really close to those transformers, right? Um, but if you are worried about too high of a voltage or too low of a voltage, most people will opt for what's called a buck booster. A buck booster is a transformer that will actually turn down your incoming voltage or turn up your incoming voltage. When you turn it down, you're actually bucking the power, right? When you turn it up, you're boosting the power. But keep in mind, you're wiring this a certain way to get the results you want. It doesn't do both, it's not magic, okay? In fact, the most common use for this in our industry was to take 277 and actually turn that down to 230 in a lot of uh, light industrial applications. As long as you're gonna turn down the voltage no more than 30%, then a buck booster is a great way to do so without investing in you know tens of thousands of dollars for larger transformers for buildings. When you size a buck booster, it's actually sized for the load amperage draw on that system. And in order to do that, you actually need to look at the minimum circuit ampacity. That's the equivalent when you talk about variable speed heat pumps. When you're turning down or up the power, it's typically within five to 20%, right? So you can turn it down five to 20% or you can turn it up five to 20% depending on the wiring configuration. You have a lot of options with these buck boosters. So the wiring is actually how you're gonna get the results and it is tedious when you go to install these. Typically it's actually done by a licensed electrician. And when you go to do this, you need to measure. No, don't guess or look at the rated. You need to measure the incoming voltage so you know how much you need to turn it down or turn it up. Remember, most of the time, we're allowed plus or minus 10% on the rated voltage. If you have a 230 volt rated condenser, then you can be as high as 253 volts and it's still gonna be safe. But as soon as you run it up past that, you're probably gonna cause control board failures. All right, let's talk about power and if it's too low coming from the street. This is something I used to see very common in municipalities across the state in Massachusetts when I was doing service. What we typically would see is a really high amperage draw, overloading of the grid in the summertime when it was warmer than 95 degrees out. And what would happen is the voltage would get too low and it would actually cause capacitor failures, control board problems, defrost boards to fail in, in heat pumps. Um, on single stage equipment, right? What ends up happening a lot of times, if you didn't know, power companies, when they know there's gonna be a high demand, they'll actually reduce the output power, the voltage, by about 5%. So they start to accommodate for that high demand in the afternoon, let's say, when it's four or 5 p.m. and over 95 degrees. If you're close to a lot of the main generation, then this isn't a problem. So typically in the cities, 5% isn't a big deal. The problem is transmission losses and issues when you get further away into those rural towns like we talked about earlier, installing a buck booster. Even though that's the common cause, that's not the only cause. I personally experienced an imbalanced electric panel before. And when this happens, you could have too much load on one leg, right, of your 208 coming into your house, your 208, 230. If you have too much of a load on one leg, your combined voltage could actually drop below what is the 90% threshold needed in order to power your devices. Or it could have been old wiring, poor connections, dirty connections. There's a lot of things that can cause low voltage at home. 
If the low voltage is consistent, meaning many days or weeks or every year, then you need to contact the power company. I'm willing to bet it's not just your house on the street that's got the problem, no matter what they tell you. You wanna make sure you get somebody out there with a good meter to measure. I personally trust my true RMS meter. Now, of course, there's the other side. If you have high voltage coming in, now, a lot of times when this happens, it actually will overheat circuit boards, cause some failures, particularly with variable speed heat pumps. Believe it or not, for industrial purposes or commercial purposes, a reduction in amperage draw due to a increase in voltage is actually a good thing if you're within, let's say, 5% on a motor. Once you go past that, you have to keep in mind the wattage calculation, amps times volt, is not linear. You'll actually start to get more and more usage as your, as your voltage goes up. So it's exponential until possible failure. All right, now that we got street power out of the way, let's talk about generators. You can operate your variable speed heat pump off of clean power using a whole home generator, not a portable generator. There's too much power fluctuations on startup and when you actually start to add load to a portable generator that you're almost guaranteed failure on that condenser. Typically, a whole home generator can range anywhere from 5 kW all the way to high as 50 kW. In order to calculate the size of the whole home generator that you need, you need to actually know thousands of watts, right? So kW and you need to provide a list of everything that you want to power. You don't have to power your entire home unless you get a generator that can handle the entire home, right? But you wanna definitely at least run the essentials. So you list out all of those devices and you need to know the amperage draw that it's rated for in order to then calculate watts, right? And then of course, once you get all of the watts for all the devices, you divide by 1000 to get KW, thousands of watts, right? Typically a whole home generator that ranges between five to 12 KW is just really sized to run the essentials. Your heating system, your refrigerator, uh, your lights, maybe some medical devices, things that are needed in the house, right? If you, if you don't have power for an extended period of time. Once you get from 12 to 20 kW, a lot of times people will add some load shedding devices in order to power the majority of the home. And these are the sizes you typically see for a heat pump, right? Because a heat pump actually will draw considerably more electricity than um, an oil burner or a gas fire furnace, right? And if your generator size between 20 to 50 kW, that's a true whole home generator and it's most likely sized to do everything in the house. Not always the case, you need to make sure you measure and know. There is some rules of thumb for older style heat pumps that actually will help you size the generator to run your heat pump plus your essentials, right? So what it was was a three, four, and five ton heat pump if you have single or multi-stage equipment, not variable speed heat pumps these days, because this does not follow this rule. For a three ton, you need a 30 amp breaker, four ton is a 40 amp breaker, and a five ton is a 50 amp breaker. And in order to accommodate that KW plus your essentials, you needed about a 14 KW generator for if you have a three ton heat pump plus your essentials, a 17 KW if it was a four ton in essentials, and of course, 20 KW or more if it's five ton in your essentials. All right, so now that we packaged up generators, let's just move on and touch on a few things when it comes to PV panels and battery storage. Just want to give you a broad overview here. I'm not going to get into sizing this because I'm not an electrician and I am not a, a panel specialist here. There's a couple important things you need to know. There's some concern out there that if too many people install PV panels on their home and they're feeding back to the grid because the voltage is higher than what the voltage coming into the home is, right? So they start back feeding into the grid. It's a positive thing because you'll turn your meter the opposite direction, you'll get a credit, right? But if too many people do this and it's not regulated well, then you'll actually cause a voltage spike for other people on your street that don't have PV. A lot of times this will happen under low load situations. So, you know, later morning when the sun's out in the summertime or early afternoon and it's not a hot day or a really cold day with a heat pump. Now that brings me to the fact that PV alone won't address all of the needs of the house when the sun's not out, right? You can't size it and get electricity when there's no sun shining on it. And this is really important um, during times of recovery, let's say early morning or uh, early evening when the sun goes down and you actually are using more electricity than you can generate. And what we do to compensate for that is actually store that power and there's multiple types of batteries out there. There's the older style lead acid batteries that require a lot of maintenance, but they're very inexpensive. You just need a lot of batteries in your home in order to power what you can. 
or of course things like the Tesla Powerwall that's a lithium ion battery. Lead acid batteries usually have more like a 1000 cycle lifetime. The life cycle on a lithium ion battery is much, much longer. And those lithium ions don't need any maintenance and are much lighter. Either way, if you're gonna start powering things from those PV panels with a battery, you're gonna to wanna to make sure you have a power inverter in order to actually change that from DC voltage to AC voltage. And that power inverter should have a surge protector. Hopefully you learned something. What did you think about the new training? If you like this and you wanna get it one year in advance, head over to my Patreon page where you can get access for last year's worth for as little as $8 a month. Thanks for joining me this week at HVAC Pro Blog, where we provide advice for residential system design, quality installation, and system diagnosis. I'll see you soon.